Hello, my name is Mark Fowler. I am the Nature Initiative Director at Grace Farms Foundation, and I would like to welcome you to the Jaguar 2030 Dialogue, a roadmap for conservation and inclusive green economies. This is being hosted by USAID, WCS, Panthera, WWF, and our partner UNDP. I am very excited to be moderating today because I have spent most of my life as a spokesperson for the natural world and for wildlife through film and television and, the, and through the Explorers Club as VP of Conservation. But I'm also very excited to host this because as Nature Initiative Director at Grace Farms Foundation, I work with my partner, Rod Katabi from the Justice Initiative and Sharon Prince, our, our founder and CEO. We work with UNDP and with USAID and, and NGOs like WCS. We work with them to combat Ill illegal wildlife trafficking. We also work to preserve large forested landscapes like the Congo, for instance. And we also work to eradicate illegal timber and mining from the, the building supply chain, as well as empower native and indigenous people so they are not exploited for forced labor and, and slave labor conditions. This I'm telling you this because this is the kind of work that is being pioneered by visionaries like Mary Melnick from USAID and like Tim Scott from UNDP who are working on this incredible holistic approach where we not only protect the wildlife, but we also protect and restore the natural environment, the native habitat, the large free roaming uh, protected areas, as well as, and just as important, we empower native and indigenous and local communities to have greener economies. That is so important and to have healthy livelihoods so that they cannot be exploited. This is the work that is on the forefront of our Jaguar 2030 dialogue. I will share a little backstory about the Jaguar, which is one of my, my favorite and one of the most incredible animals on earth. Not only is it the most beautiful and powerful of the uh, most powerful big jaws of all the big cats, but, um, but it's also, it's an icon and it's an apex carnivore that if we're saving the big cats, we're also preserving their habitat. We're also preserving our habitat, the jungles and the, and the large natural areas. So this is what this dialogue is all about. There is the 2030 roadmap, Jaguar 2030 roadmap is an exciting project that WCS, Panthera and WWF are working on with UNDP. You're gonna be hearing all about this work today. We've got thought leaders from from Christian Samper from WCS, we've got Howard Quigley from Panthera, and then we're working, and then the 2030 Roadmap, our major partners, the actual countries where they are creating a Jaguar, a Jaguar corridor in Latin America. These countries, all of the partner and range countries of the Jaguar, we will be hearing from them as well. So without further ado, I am excited to, to launch our 2030 Jaguar Dialogue a roadmap for conservation and inclusive green economies. Uh, just as a little side note uh, for some housekeeping, you can always check in using hop in into the sessions. Um, you can use the sessions tab. You can also do a lot of networking via hop in. And there's also a, a chat box that you can, you can put in questions and comments. Um, one other thing that is important for this dialogue is we have a translation uh, app and a translation option because we're going to be hearing from Spanish and Portuguese language in this doc in our uh, dialogue today. So if you want to use the translation, go ahead and click underneath me, scroll down underneath my video in the uh, hop in, and you can click on the translation for the language you're looking to hear. So without further ado, I am very excited to introduce our UNDP partner, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, Assistant Secretary General and Assistant Administrator of the Regional Bureau for Latin American and the Caribbean for UNDP. Luis, welcome. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of UNDP, USAID, Panthera, Worldwide Fund for Nature, and the Wildlife Conservation Society, I want to welcome you all to the Jaguar Dialogue, a roadmap for conservation and inclusive green economies. Excellencies, distinguished government representatives, policymakers, and practitioners from the public, private, and civil society sectors, and international organizations. Today, 
we have the opportunity to discuss the importance of investing in the Jaguar landscape as part of the efforts to accelerate progress on the SDGs and to build forward better in the COVID-19 context. This discussion is not centered on wildlife and conservation only. It goes further into analyzing how the management of and investment in Jaguar landscapes has an impact on communities, societies, and economies who depend on biodiversity and ecosystem services. The Jaguar landscapes has a direct link to human society, human security, community livelihoods, health, and our efforts to eradicate poverty and reduce inequalities. Please allow me to share how important these dialogues are for the Latin American region. The Jaguar Ranch countries provide over 17% of the world's carbon storage and sequestration in some 8.6% of the world's surface area. Nearly 25 million people benefit from non-wood forest products within Jaguar habitat, and 46 million people benefit from the water provisioning services within the range and many more downstream. Millions of people depend on nature and culture-based tourism within the range. Those figures clearly show the importance of investing in Jaguar landscape conservation and how critical it is to accelerate progress on the SDGs, addressing the dual nature climate crisis and building forward better. The private sector is a key partner in this. We need to promote their engagement to generate benefits that also include green jobs, inclusive growth, and the transition to more sustainable productive sectors, such as forestry, ranching, agriculture, and infrastructure. Today's Jaguar, Jaguar Dialogue and the Big Cat Dialogue series offer a platform to convene and strengthen partnerships and to bring together voices and insights that otherwise do not have a chance to connect. Through today's discussion and our follow-up action on the ground, we have an opportunity to generate greater awareness and new momentum and investments around Jaguar landscapes and broader efforts to build forward better. I would like to thank you once again for your participation and commitment. I'm eager to discover what can be achieved together through these dialogues and mutual collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis Philippe. We really appreciate your comments and your welcoming remarks. Uh, I'd like to introduce a very exciting Jaguar 2030 video that we will be seeing right now. Thank you. La declaración de Nueva York por el jaguar hacia el 2030 significa el compromiso de 14 países para proteger esta especie de gran valor cultural y económico. The species do not know about political frontiers, so that's why we need to work together as uh, countries, as humankind, to protect this magnificent species. This is the kind of conference, the kind of gathering that doesn't happen all the time. And therefore this conference is important enough for us to understand the connectivity of range countries in ensuring that the Jaguar continues to be protected. Intentaremos trabajar sociedad civil, comunidades rurales, poblaciones indígenas que tienen tanto que ver culturalmente con la protección del jaguar y del felino. Recognizing the jaguars not just a symbol of wildlife, but it is a symbol of the planetary health. We need assistance, we need guidance, we need cooperation with national and international organizations as well as government. Al fin a los conocimientos y que se capacita el personal guardaparque, porque los proyectos acaban y no hay una continuidad. We need to make Jaguar an icon for sustainable development. Si nosotros los países de distribución del jaguar perdemos el hábitat y los corredores 
del jaguar, posiblemente eh, los, nuestros mismos países no logremos los objetivos de París. This is the first step to the pathway to the conservation of Jaguar. Together, we can do it. Let's join our forts and let's save the Jaguar. Wow, that, I get so inspired seeing the Jaguar, but I also want to say it was incredible to see the, the work that UNDP has done with its partners to unify all of the range countries and also to represent the indigenous people. So this is a very exciting time. Do you know today is Human Rights Day? We also had International Jaguar Day very recently. So this is very poignant work. And I want to share, you know, the excitement of the Jaguar 2030 map by introducing Howard Quigley. He is the Executive Director of Conservation and Science and Director of the Jaguar Program at Panthera. And they are doing incredible work. So Howard will be presenting all of the work that they are doing at Panthera for the roadmap. Thank you and welcome, Howard. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to all of you for participating in Jaguar Dialogue. And what a great kickoff we had on Tuesday for the Big Cats Dialogue. I think it was a wonderful set of ideas and opportunities were displayed on Tuesday. And I think we're gonna see the same thing here today. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, to see this amount of attention focused on Jaguars is so satisfying and so gratifying. I've worked on Jaguars for over 30 years now, and to see this kind of international attention to the species is just, well, nothing more than thrilling. And as opposed to say tigers and African lions, for instance, we're way ahead of the game because we've got jaguars still on 50% of their historic range. Um, this is reason for hope. Next. I won't spend any time today describing the jaguar, although I think it may be missing from the agenda, but I won't talk about its range, the threats, its ecology. Um, you probably know a little bit about it if you're already here and watching today. Next. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Alan Urbinowitz. Uh, he also had worked with jaguars and jaguar science and conservation for years, wrote two books about the species, described the jaguar corridor. And just as we were torching off the organization committee and the UN meeting and starting to write the, the roadmap, he succumbed to cancer. He would also be over the top thrilled uh, to see the attention to the species that, that's happening here today. And you could probably speak to this much, much better to the roadmap today than I can. <laughs> so here's a shout out to Alan and his contribution to today and every day of Jaguar conservation moving forward. Next. As I mentioned, um, and as, as was mentioned in the video, the March 1st meeting at the UN in 2018 was a seminal moment. Um, range countries at the United Nations representing their countries around a table discussing Jaguars and their importance to everyone. The signing of a statement on the importance of Jaguars and the need to do something. It was an amazing moment. Next. And in all of this, let's remember that it's not just this moment. It's, it's the importance that Jaguars have had and how they played in human cultures in Latin America for more than two centuries, displayed by the dancing Jaguar of Copal to the carvings uh, by the Olmec. The worship that this animal drew from human cultures, and although now we use the image uh, of jaguars on cookies and gas stations, this is still a recognition of the power this animal has and its connections to us, really. Next. And we also know the power that the jaguar has in shaping natural and native communities in which it lives as an apex carnivore, as Mark said. Next and acting as an umbrella for the species conservation of all the species around it under its conservation net, we might, we might say, next. 
And this is the base from which we were all brought together to put together the Jaguar roadmap, the Jaguar 2030 roadmap. Next. And truly, um, this is an offering uh, for sure. It is put together and influenced by many, many experts. And sure, um, it's, it's also the brainchild of Midori Paxton and Tim Scott at UNDP. In the end, the roadmap, this document is yours. Uh, it's for governments, it's for private citizens, NGOs, anybody. If you're in Jaguar range, it's yours. If you're a citizen of the world, it's, it's yours. The roadmap truly is yours and you, you own it. So this, uh, we, have, we know that we have solutions. That's why this is so hopeful. Um, like like uh, looking at this Jaguar in, the, in an oil palm plantation with people that work there every single day or the pineapple plantation I visited in Honduras where the owner was so excited about having a Jaguar walk through just his little corridor of forest between his fields, enhancing his life next. And we'll get ecotourism back. At some point, we will have ecotourism back. Um, this downturn has just made us think more about the models that we've heard about and that, that, that we talked about on Tuesday. How do we make this work for people who don't visit these sites? How does it work in areas where you can't see jaguars? How can we make these communities, these human communities, still benefit from the fact that they live with jaguars? These are the kinds of things that as we grow out of this COVID environment, we will have to think about, and there's already so much discussion about it. It will be a very exciting time over the next year. Uh, next. So let's review some of the 2030 roadmap. At first, we modeled it after the range-wide conservation document for the snow leopard, affectionately known as GSLEP. Um, but the GSLEP was slightly different. For the Jaguar, uh, we, we took a few different tacks. Uh, for one, we knew more about the Jaguar range than we do and did about uh, the snow leopard for sp and, and also specific threats. Next. We set a lofty goal to strengthen the Jaguar corridor across range countries by securing 30 priority Jaguar landscapes by 2030, stimulating sustainable development, reducing Jaguar human conflict in human dominated landscapes and increasing the security and connectivity of core protected landscapes, thus meeting globally significant biodiversity goals. Next. And several objectives, still, still lofty and creating the foundation that is justifying the, the Jaguar 2030, as I just went through a few notes about, um, providing a conservation framework like the, like the Jaguar corridor, giving background for national engagement. How does this happen? How can it happen? Providing regional engagement details, and then details on conservation actions, and then also so reviewing some of the, the baselines uh, that we already have for Jaguar knowledge. Next. I would also mention that the Jaguar 2030 roadmap is being translated into Spanish right now and should be available in January sometime and hopefully then in Portuguese. The, the point is to make it available to as many people as possible. Next. A few specifics about what's contained in the roadmap. The, the first section contains many of the issues that I, I just mentioned, um, but speaks to the trends in the populations, uh, the sustainable development next. And then a section on core principles and different scales at which Jaguar conservation can take place next. And then we divided the rest of the roadmap into logical themes or pathways, as we call them, uh, like the coordination among countries, um, then the development of national strategies, mainstreaming conservation applications into communities and local governments, um, then taking those the solutions to scale 
for conflict reduction and even across borders. And lastly, Pathway 4 um, tries to describe some of the issues with financial sustainability, again, touching on the value of, um, uh, of the species. And then we have a profile uh, that you see here in this slide. We have a profile of every single country that, that holds jaguars, and even uh, the countries that used to be, um, used to have jaguars that don't now, and showing the core populations, the corridors, next. Followed by a section that focuses on each and every transboundary area in jaguar range, and there are a lot of them, next. And toward the end, there's a, a table to, that we provided with an overview of the activities that have already been undertaken. And there has been a lot of work, which uh, is, is uh, uh, we're very fortunate to have. That's for sure with the Jaguar. One thing is that we have a, an abundance of information. We need more, but we have an abundance of information to work with. Next. What's next? We've gotten 15 countries to endorse the road, roadmap uh, recently. That doesn't mean that the other three haven't endorsed or, or said no, they uh, simply haven't responded. The translation is underway, as I said. Um, we'll look for international meetings to promote awareness next year, encourage countries to begin the selection of 30 landscapes for the concentrated efforts and try to secure international support. And for those countries that don't have national plans for Jaguars, we will encourage that. For those that already have uh, national conservation plans for Jaguars, we'll encourage them to update them if they aren't already updated. Next. And I encourage you all to, to, to review the pathways and the, the priorities, it's like pathway one with, with notes on data sharing and international technology support. Next. Because each of the pathway, in each one of the, of the pathways, there's additional detail on actions that can be prioritized, even customized by each country, depending on their circumstances. For instance, in one country, anti-predation techniques might be best uh, supported within the Ministry of Agriculture, while another country, it may be best supported within the Cattle Growers Association. Next. Or like here in pathway three, where communities might have a chance to reforest corridors or work with growers to make harvest more jaguar and wildlife friendly without decreasing production. Next. Anyway, I wish uh, uh, there were more time for more specifics, but I hope this has given you a bit of an overview of the uh, Jaguar 2030 roadmap. It's a, it's a, there's a justification, it's need, it's information, it's yours, please promote it and use it. And uh, for those of you who have cel who celebrated the International Jaguar Day just uh, a week ago, um, and it was a wonderful outpouring, uh, whether you read a blog post or um, wrote yourself, um, thank you for being part of it. I, I hope you all went to sleep with Jaguar rosettes dancing in your, in your head. So thank you. Um, next, and I'll turn it over, turn it back to Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Howard. That was amazing. And what I like about what I love about the 2030 Jaguar roadmap is that there is hope that we do still have the Jaguars in 50% of their range, and we're going to increase that. And, and also, I appreciate you bringing up the fact that we're doing this in the context of a, of a, a worldwide pandemic, which is was caused by, you know, encroaching deep within the jungles and extracting timber unsustainably. It was caused by bringing out and trafficking wildlife and, and bringing that in, in bushmeat. This, kind of, this is the kind of work that is meant to stop that and to empower local communities so that, so that they can't be exploited by organized crime to, to do the work. And, and that way we can, we can save the jaguar, we can save the large forested landscapes, and we can actually empower local people, native, indigenous, and local communities to have sustainable economies. So with that being said, that's, I'm very excited to be hosting the Spotlight Chat. Um, this is going to be the topic of our Spotlight Chat is how to leverage partnerships that catalyze synergies between jaguar habitat conservation and the transition to a more inclusive 
and greener economy for local populations and for local communities. So there are people from the field we're gonna be hearing from right now today that are doing some of the most groundbreaking work. We're gonna be hearing from four different panelists. Uh, for st to start, we will hear from our partner, Lucy Aquino, who is the CEO and for WWF Paraguay. And you will hear about the incredible work she's doing. For those of you who are uh, need a translation, this is the moment that you may want to translate. Some of our speakers will be speaking in Spanish or Portuguese. Thank you. Sorry, I have to mute. Um. Yeah. All right, so here we go. I believe we have um, our colleague coming in for on the first of our chat. We've got Lucy Aquino, CEO, and for WWF Paraguay. Lucy, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Good morning. How are you? Great. Very good, thank you. We, we're very excited to hear about your work uh, empowering communities and, and creating a greener economy in Paraguay. Fantastic, great. Okay, um, do I go, Mark? Yes, please, feel free to tell us about your work, thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, I've, we all know many successes have been achieved uh, for big cuts supported by civil society, governments, communities, scientific organizations, and academia. But we are still losing the battle. Jaguar population continue to de decline across Latin America. COVID-19 is giving us a very hard lesson to which we must adapt very quickly because this varies only a small predator that appears as an indicator of how badly we are treating the planet. COVID-19 is an emerging disease that arose as a result of a misuse and mismanagement of wildlife and its habitat. Today, we have an opportunity to examine how we deliver results. So big cats conservation come as an opportunity. If we are to achieve a green recovery, we must look at non-traditional actors, partnership, with private and productive sector, the market, consumers, the financial institution and infrastructure developers. This alliance will ensure transformational changes and achieve and the impact of production and consumption on Jawar priority landscape. Will, this will be reduced also. Moreover, there is a genuine increasing interest and commitment from this sector to produce these changes. Latin America holds some of the biggest deforestation front in the world. And 2020 Living Planet Report indicates that Latin America is losing more biodiversity than any other world, any other places in the world. Jaguar habitat protection can help us change this trend. Today, Paraguay is celebrating the ratification of the extension of the zero deforestation law in the Atlantic forest. This was possible thanks to the coalition called 
for los bosques of more than 60 CSOs from the Environmental, Social, and Health Organization. In year 2004, World Wildlife Fund promoted the law and it was approved by only two years. Since then, this law was extended four times. And today, on December 9, 2020, yes, today, this was approved for 10 more years. The Jaguar is one of the main stars of this accomplishment. As part of this extension of the zero deforestation law campaign, we were using a slogan that introduced the Jaguar Cal Paraguay Mas Jaguarete, as it's become the iconic species in the Americas and the pride of the citizens. The Atlantic forest hold more one of the most threatened jaguar population. However, in recent years, they have been a slight jaguar population increase. And this is a joint result of civil society organizations like World Wildlife Fund and Fundación Vida Silvestre Argentina and other local NGOs that promote the implementation of sound public policies and consider robust scientific information. Also, we are developing a large scale communication campaign in the Atlantic forest with several stakeholders in Brazil, Argentina and Paraguay to call attention to all level and especially the youth because they are the present and the future and they cannot make the same mistake our generations and other older ones made. The most important Jaguar strongholds are located in protected areas. So the national protected system must have strong capabilities and collaboration among them is key. Jaguar habitat protection can be a natural based solution to deal with climate change and adapt. These are actions designed to protect sustainable manage and restore natural and modified ecosystem that address social challenges effectively, while also adapting and sustainability, providing human, human well-being and biodiversity benefits. In Latin America, mega projects are racing to speedy economic development, particularly focus on infrastructure projects without much attention to necessary environmental and social safeguards. This is nullifying decades of effort from conservation. This needs serious attention. We have to focus on landscape management plans to ensure that infrastructure is being developed, taking in consideration the conservation of critical habitat and to avoid severe impact on the population of this unique, magnificent species. We're also developing opportunities for diversifying livelihoods of communities that are depend on ecosystem and share this ecosystem with big cats. The restoration, conservation and re reconnection of jaguar habitat can contribute to the achievement of at least 11 of the 17 sustain sustainable development goals, benefiting more than 53 million people in 2018 in an unprecedented, absolutely unprecedented effort, 14 of the 18 countries in the Jaguar range, along with non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations, adopted the Jaguar 2030 Roma, the plan to achieve the conservation of this cat through regional cooperation. Before the pandemic, we believe that 2020 was going to be a crucial year for the future of biodiversity but it has been pushed back to at least 2021, the path to Kunming, a negotiation of the post-2020 global framework of biodiversity, once represented a starting point to reverse alarming patterns. Despite this delay, we cannot let this unique situation pass us by, and we must do our part to maintain the will and sense of urgency. With the current environmental, economic and social crisis, the opportunity is even greater and more ambitious countries 
more ambitious for all the countries in the region and around the world will be to implement and transform transformative recovery founded and on equality and sustainability. Mark, over to you again. I stop here and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, thank you for ending on the note. Of, first of all, it's incredible to hear the work of WWF and Paraguay, but ending on the note of equality and sustainability. That's what we're talking about here is, is how to how to increase the equality and inclusion of native indigenous people and women, for instance. And that brings us right to our next speaker. Um, Igua Lopez is the president of the Organization of Indigenous Women United for the Biodiversity of Panama. Igua is doing incredible work uh, empowering women and indigenous people. And this is such, so important for the success of the, the 2030 Jaguar Roadmap. This work is, this is how we stop the, the, the exploitation of indigenous people. And this is how we empower um, new and, and sustainable livelihoods for, for indigenous and for women in this region. So Igua, without further ado, can you please tell us about your incredible work down there in Panama? Disculpe, ya, ahora sí. Sí, buenos días. Estoy súper emocionada por estar aquí, la verdad, eh, entre tantos colegas que hacen un trabajo tremendo en cada una de sus organizaciones. Bueno, primero, soy Iguayigili López, soy de la Organización de Mujeres Indígenas Unidas por la Biodiversidad, que es una organización comunitaria compuesta y liderizada por mujeres indígenas. Pertenezco al pueblo cuna, soy cuna en eh, mi pueblo, es eh, del lado del Caribe, en Panamá. <ríe> aproximadamente somos unos 40 mil personas que vivimos en Panamá, eh, quizás dentro de las áreas, eh, de las áreas comarcales a la cual nosotros le denominamos, que son áreas semi-autónomas, eh, somos unos el 50% de la población cuna, nuestra lengua materna es el cuna, y, eh, y estamos rodeados de mar, bosques, de, de todo lo verde, entonces es como para contarles y situarles dónde estamos, es, yo pertenezco por ejemplo a una comunidad muy pequeña del Golfo, del, del Golfo de Panamá, es una comunidad de casi 500 personas, se llama Ilido, y escogimos esas, esa área para iniciar este proyecto cuando hicimos la, a, las reuniones con pequeñas donaciones e iniciamos esta, esta iniciativa de conservar los aguares. Eh, escogimos esa área porque en esas áreas todavía existen, se ven huellas de jaguares y hay una convivencia muy fuerte entre lo que son los animales, los tapires, los mamíferos y lo que es el jaguar. Entonces fue una área en la que quisimos trabajar porque esas comunidades, además de ser comunidades cazadoras, todavía mantienen esa relación eh, espiritual que, que tenemos nosotros los pueblos indígenas con los ecosistemas. Entonces era, era empezar un trabajo, un poco de eh, conocer la visión de la mujer, pero también conocer la visión de los hombres en cuanto a la conservación de los jaguares. Dentro de, dentro de la cultura cuna, porque estamos trabajando dos, con dos comunidades, que es la comunidad del pueblo cuna, y me voy del lado del Darién, que es la comunidad de Ipetí en Verá, que es otra población. Bueno, en Panamá somos siete pueblos indígenas, ¿verdad? Y uno de esos pueblos es el pueblo cuna y el pueblo en Verá. Entonces, en el pueblo en Verá están las compañeras en Verá, que es Ipetí en Verá, y también decidimos trabajar con ellos por el hecho de que ellos también todavía mantienen estas relaciones intrínsecas espirituales con los jaguares. Entonces, eh, iniciamos este bello proyecto porque la verdad también es una experiencia para nosotras. Nosotras como organización de mujeres lo que hacemos dentro de nuestro trabajo es empoderar a las mujeres indígenas que muchas veces no tenemos esa oportunidad de llegar quizás a tener un nivel de conocimiento, eh, digámoslo así, de educación formal y empoderamos a las mujeres en temas de derecho, derecho de pueblos indígenas, 
indígena, de género, biodiversidad. Ese es nuestro trabajo. Entonces lo que hicimos es, ahora lo que estamos haciendo con este proyecto es combinar ese conocimiento científico que tienen los pueblos indígenas con el conocimiento científico que tiene la ciencia en tema de ecosistema, protección de jaguares. Y por eso es que estamos trabajando de mano con Yaguará, que tiene los técnicos, y nosotras que tenemos ese conocimiento tradicional. Entonces es como una combinación de, ambas, de ambos conocimientos, ese conocimiento científico y ese conocimiento tradicional que tenemos los, los pueblos indígenas. Es una experiencia muy bonita porque... También lo que nos trajo la pandemia, hablaba la compañera, es tratar de que esta pandemia, pues además de traernos todas unas, unas brechas sociales increíbles de esa, falta de, de esa falta de oportunidades a la tecnología, de esa falta de que los niños puedan acceder a la educación, con la pandemia quizás se vio mucho más eh, social, digámoslo así, en los lados de los pueblos indígenas. Entonces tuvimos que cambiar esta metodología y usar a nuestro favor la tecnología. Eh, aprendimos rápidamente, como le digo a mis compañeras, usar la tecnología del Zoom, tratar de ver que, no, que las comunidades que tienen acceso a internet pudieran incorporarse a nuestros talleres. Entonces, fue todo un reto para nosotras porque tuvimos que muchas veces tratar de apoyar a algunos, algunas de las personas que están en las comunidades en poder conectarse a internet, tratar de dar eh, seminarios súper rápidos sobre Zoom, como ahorita que me han enseñado cómo utilizar este sistema. Entonces es súper interesante, eh, durante estos meses de dentro de la cuarentena cambiamos nuestros talleres que lo hacíamos presencial en las comunidades porque nosotras vamos a las comunidades, hicimos talleres virtuales, hicimos 10 talleres virtuales en la que eh, combinamos, trajimos, eh, invitamos a sabios ancestrales del pueblo Cuna y del pueblo Emberá para que nos narraran cuentos sobre jaguares porque es increíble cómo los pueblos indígenas tienen cuentos sobre jaguares y cómo nuestra relación desde nuestra sabiduría es con los aguares muy cerquita entonces esa, esa parte de los sabios, los invitamos a nuestros talleres, a estos sabios desde sus comunidades y recuerdo muy bien un taller en la que decía Beatriz que se tuvo que subir el Arga, que es un conocedor de esta sabiduría al techo de su casa para poder conectarse y él entre mala señal y todo pudo dar su, su seminario taller, entonces estas experiencias nos dan, a des, nos dan un poco estas buenas prácticas de que se puede hacer un trabajo de mano con el conocimiento de las ciencias entonces, estos talleres estuvieron una combinación de saber clasificar los felinos que hay dentro de la biodiversidad de Panamá, pero también cómo el pueblo cuna y el pueblo enverá a través de las narraciones, de sus narraciones orales, tienen esas relaciones con los jaguares. Diez talleres que pudimos dar entre septiembre, octubre y noviembre. Recientemente estamos terminando estos talleres, pero sumado a eso hemos sistematizado dos cuentos en veraz a través de los sabios ancestrales, tenemos ya sistematizado, estamos pronto a imprimirlo, queremos en enero imprimir estos dos cuentos, están traducidos tanto en cuna como en enverá, son dos cuentitos cortos para los niños de primaria, eh, uno es la, el, la relación del jaguar con el ñeque, en la cultura cuna el ñeque es como el archienemigo, le digo yo, del jaguar, que siempre anda persiguiéndolo, entonces estamos narrando este cuentito, y luego está el cuento en verá, que es el imama, en, 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 en verá, jaguar quiere decir imama, entonces imama es el wandra, o sea, es el espíritu, es el poder que, tiene, que tienen las personas cuando tienen una conexión con el jaguar, entonces estamos contando este cuentito cortito a través de una narración que nos hizo un sabio en verá, son esos dos productos que vamos a tener súper interesantes que vamos a estar lanzando, estamos haciendo un video animado súper también con un grupo de de cunas cineastas en la que vamos a narrar esos mismos cuentos pero animado para los niños o sea todos estos productos al final queremos que cuando abran las clases los niños tengan estos materiales pero a la vez puedan tener estos materiales tanto en cuna, en enverá en español, que eso, eso hace falta mucho, o sea nos dimos cuenta en el proyecto que no tenemos materiales didácticos dirigidos a las escuelas que tenemos mucho material científico dirigido a la ciencia, pero no tenemos material didáctico. Entonces, esta es un poco la experiencia que hemos tenido nosotras. Eh, la verdad, súper agradecida por haberles compartido esta experiencia que hemos tenido como comunidad local. Gracias.
Wow, thank you so much, Igwa. Um, I just want to say that your work is so empower it's so powerful and and the work that you're doing to empower women and indigenous people. And what you said about it, you know, incorporating big science and and traditional knowledge and traditional science into one message. That is so important for us in the West and in developed countries. We don't, we need that spiritual connection that indigenous people believe in. And we need to learn from the spiritual and indigenous practices that are more sustainable than our modern world oftentimes. So we are very grateful. And I'm very glad to hear that you're empowering women and indigenous people in Panama. Um, our next speaker is Fernando Camacho. He is the director general of, he is the general director of outreach and institutional development and national for the National Commission for Natural Protected Areas in Mexico. So I'd really like to welcome uh, Fernando Camacho and hear about your work, Fernando. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I apologize and I'm going to speak in Spanish. Eh, muchas gracias a todas y todos por la invitación. Me siento muy honrado por estar aquí, pero también un poco nervioso porque me toca hablar a nombre de muchos colegas guardaparques, eh, académicos, eh, miembros de la sociedad civil, pero sobre todo de, la, de las comunidades que trabajan por la conservación de, de esta gran especie, de, de la especie de, del felino más grande de Latinoamérica. Y aquí eh, me sumo a lo que decía Howard hace ratito, eh, Aún hay esperanza y creo que hay esperanza porque tenemos a comunidades y a personas como Iwa trabajando por la conservación del jaguar. Eh, yo hablo no solamente a nombre de lo que hacemos en la Comisión Nacional de Áreas Naturales Protegidas de México, sino también eh, me pidieron que eh, fuera portavoz de lo, del trabajo de los sistemas de parques eh, de América Latina. México es actualmente el coordinador de la Red Parques, que es una iniciativa que engloba eh, a 19 sistemas de áreas protegidas de Latinoamérica. Y esta iniciativa busca eh, intercambiar experiencias, generar conocimiento y trabajar en conjunto para eh, fortalecer los sistemas de áreas protegidas. Y es justo lo que se necesita para poder lograr la conservación del jaguar. Trabajar a escala eh, continental, eh, el jaguar, eh, su ámbito de distribución es enorme y justo necesitamos desarrollar iniciativas que nos permitan eh, dialogar eh, y establecer programas a escala regional. Eh, ya lo dije, sin lugar a dudas, para mantener el jaguar se requiere eh, trabajar con la sociedad civil, con la academia, con las organizaciones de cooperación internacional, pero sobre todo con las comunidades dueñas del territorio, para poder mantener la forma de vida de las personas a la par de poder lograr la conservación de la biodiversidad. Eh, ya existen ya rutas trazadas, sin lugar a dudas, la Agenda 2030 es una guía para mantener la riqueza de, de las comunidades y de la biodiversidad, y para que las personas tengan una forma digna de ganarse la vida, más aún a la luz de las consecuencias del COVID-19 que ya nos decía Igua que acrecenta las, eh, eh, las diferencias entre, entre las personas y es allí donde tenemos que trabajar. Para hacer frente a esto, eh, en nuestro país hemos desarrollado, hemos trabajado para promover el desarrollo sostenible desde una visión donde se pueda lograr la armonía entre las metas económicas, el bienestar social y el equilibrio ecológico, y en este momento enfatizando el trabajo con las comunidades, las dueñas y poseedoras de la enorme biodiversidad que tenemos y de la cual dependemos como, como civilización. Eh, conservar este felino que, es, eh, que ha sido reconocido por las culturas mesoamericanas requerirá que nos, los gobiernos nos enfoquemos en reducir los rezagos sociales, sin lugar a dudas, entre si sigan manteniéndose estos rezagos sociales, va a ser muy difícil lograr la conservación. Y necesitamos recuperar los espacios para el desarrollo de la biodiversidad. En México eh, estamos impulsando programas de, de gobierno 
que permiten o que buscan recuperar eh, los espacios eh, arbolados, la, los ecosistemas, como estrategia de desarrollo social. Eh, y eso es algo que eh, nos gustaría compartir con nuestros colegas de América Latina, porque solo así podremos dar ese espacio para que el jaguar se pueda mover entre los países. Es necesario recordar que la conservación de la biodiversidad, ya lo mencionaba Lucy, tiene un rol muy importante en la adaptación y en la mitigación al cambio climático. No podemos pensar que podamos hacer frente al, al enorme reto que, que es el cambio climático si no consideramos a la biodiversidad como eje central. Y ahí es donde el jaguar también juega un rol importante. Este felino eh, es una pieza clave en, 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 para la biodiversidad y para eh, mantener servicios ecosistémicos. En México eh, estuvimos trabajando y hemos trabajado eh, en la región del Pacífico, en, un, en una región muy importante que llamamos el Corredor del Jaguar, para incrementar el pago de servicios ambientales a esas zonas donde el jaguar está caminando para que los dueños y poseedores de la tierra puedan seguir manteniendo la cobertura eh, vegetal y de esa manera mantener la zona de distribución del jaguar. Eh, ya me queda poco tiempo, creo que es necesario pensar a futuro qué tenemos que hacer, construir una visión común, y por eso creo que las eh, redes como la red parques es muy importante que nos permita trabajar de manera transporteriza. Creemos que también es necesario desarrollar un sistema de intercambio de información, monitoreo, evaluación, basado en el, en el intercambio científico y técnico este, entre los países. Y, sin lugar a dudas, iniciativas de comunicación. Por eso celebro mucho este foro de alto nivel, este, donde podemos trabajar y, y compartir lo que los distintos países están haciendo. Eh, una vez más, muchas gracias. Y muchas gracias a, a todos los colegas, eh, como IGUA, eh, a, a las comunidades que trabajan para mantener eh, esta especie. Gracias, Marc. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that was very powerful. Thank you so much, um, Fernando. And we are excited. Uh, so now we've heard from we've heard from Mexico, Paraguay, we've heard from Panama. And so I'm very excited to now have our speaker from his name is Mario Haberfeld, and he's an ecotourism entrepreneur from Brazil. Brazil is obviously a very important country when we're talking about um, range, Jaguar range countries. We've had all of these countries are working together. It's groundbreaking work. And I'm excited to hear from Mario about how he's using ecotourism as a way to create a, a green uh, and sustainable uh, livelihoods for local people and for local communities, as well as for people to travel and see the beauty of the Jaguar. So without further ado, Mario Haberfeld, welcome. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to, to be here, to be part of this panel. So again, my name is Mario Haberfeld. I actually uh, used to be a race car driver, but always passionate about uh, big cats, been traveling to Africa uh, since I was 12 years old. And once I retired from car racing, I decided I needed to help uh, wildlife in Brazil. So the idea is to um, help develop ecotourism in Brazil uh, based on Jaguar viewing. So the same model that you have in Africa where people go and see uh, lions and leopards, we wanted to develop that in Brazil. We chose the Pantanal uh, region of, the Bra of Brazil. It's the largest wetland in the world. It's a more open area than the Amazon, for instance, so theoretically easier to, to see animals there. And the Pantanal is 95% privately owned. And in all this area, you have cattle ranching. So there is a historic uh, fight conflict between Jaguars and cattle ranchers. And Jaguars have been killed uh, in Brazil, unfortunately, for the last 200, 250 years since cattle got there. Our idea was to change that, to make Jaguars 
be seen as an asset, not uh, as a pest. So what we did is um, we started developing ecotourism. We chose a site called Cayman Ecological Refuge, is a 53,000 hectare land. Um, where there were three lodges for the last 30 years and jaguars were not seen. So they had about three, three jaguar sightings a year and we started doing habituation, which basically is following uh, a few jaguars for a long time until those jaguars understand that you don't mean any harm to them and stop running away from the vehicles. They treat the vehicles basically like a tree. And each generation that goes on, the more relaxed uh, the generation is. Uh, it worked pretty well. Uh, you, we went from three uh, sightings a year to over 900 last year. Um, again, in 2019, about 98% of the guests that visited us uh, were able to see at least one Jaguar in the wild. And with all of that, uh, what happened is that the lodge occupancy increased almost 300%. I think that's where the virtual circle starts working. So you increase the lodge occupancy, you generate uh, an, a different revenue to the landowner in the ecotourism apart from uh, cattle ranching. With the increase in, in the lodge occupancy, you have to hire a lot more people. So uh, a lot of local people have jobs and this increases the um, the household income for many families. So for instance, you used to have people that were uh, simply cowboys. Now either they're still a cowboy or they moved up and now are, are guides. But now the whole family have jobs. So the wife is working in the lodge, the daughter is working in the lodge, the son uh, became a guide. And in some cases, the, the household income increased by 20 times. So now these same people, the local people, they used to see Jaguar as pests and they used to kill Jaguars. Now they protect these Jaguars because they see that their whole livelihood depends on this one single animal. So this is what we did uh, in the Pantanal. We have expanded uh, to different areas in the Pantanal. We're working in more lodges uh, around the Pantanal. We expanded the, the same model uh, actually to the Atlantic forest now where we're starting to develop uh, the same kind of uh, program. And uh, with time, we, apart from ecotourism, we develop a scientific branch where we're learning more and more about jaguar behavior in the wild because I think very little is known through this habituation work. We managed to be following different generations, how jaguars disperse, for instance, with Esperanza, which means hope in Portuguese, uh, which was the first Jaguar we habituated. Uh, within the time we've been working with her, which is for the last nine years, she has already had uh, seven cubs, 13 grand cubs, and now we're following her great grand cub. So we're learning a lot about science as well. We have an educational branch, a social development branch, a rewilding branch where we were able to reintroduce uh, jaguar cubs that had lost their mother when they were about two months old, both in the Pantanal and in the Amazon and in the process of doing that in Iberá uh, in Argentina, uh, as well as in the Atlantic forest. And we have a different newer branch, which we call forests, where we look for biodiversity, uh, biodiversity rich uh, areas and try with the help of our supporters to buy that land simply for conservation. We managed to acquire some land already in the Amazon and more recently uh, 35,000 hectares land uh, near Caima, which is where we started our project and with that, uh, we're already creating about a 230,000 uh, long uh, biological corridor within the Pantanal. So uh, basically, this is how, how we started. A lot to talk about, but I wanted to emphasize on this ecotourism front that we have, which I really believe creates uh, a very nice virtual circle because it's good for the landowner, it's good for the local people, and obviously good for jaguars and all the animals that uh, inhabit the same biome with it. 
Wow, thank you so much. That is really fascinating work, Mario. I, count me in to come to uh, on one of your expeditions to see a jaguar. I was in, I'll just tell a quick story. I was in Ecuador in the, um, in the Amazonian, in the Amazon portion of Ecuador. And we were out, we were out hunting with, uh, with the native people were hunting, the Kofani Indians were hunting for food, a capybara. And while we were out in the jungle, we came in and we were tracking this capybara. We actually heard the chuff of a jaguar and we heard the, we heard the, the, the leaves breaking and boy, you want to talk about feeling alive. You want to talk about the awe and wonder that you can feel from a beautiful, incredible big cat and a, an alpha carnivore. I felt that. And I, and I also really loved and respected the, 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 the sacred, the way that the indigenous people look at the sacredness of, of the jaguar. So I, I, am, I digress with my own incredible experiences in ecotourism and in working with to preserve jaguars. But I, I wanted to share with everybody here, I wanted to ask a question because this is our dialogue. We've got about 10 more minutes. Um, and I wanted to, you know, we've had a lot of interest from our people um, in our chats asking questions. So first I'd like to start with a question of, you know, this, our topic is how to create more inclusive and greener uh, economies in the range countries and with the communities uh, in order to support this work. So um, the question I'd like to focus on first for each of you is with community key stakeholders uh, being so key uh, and, and those partnerships with communities, um, what are some of the and what are some of the long term um, ways that we can engage local communities in partnerships in Jaguar conservation? Um, the, the ecotourism has obviously, um, Mario, thank you. The ecotourism is incredibly important, uh, but I, I really am looking forward to hearing about these sustainable livelihoods and engaging, you know, indigenous people and women, for instance, um, in in these in these native and indigenous communities to protect them from um, from exploitation and from being run off their lands and from forced labor, for instance. So so. Um, I would look. I looked. I will throw the question to uh, to Lucy first from uh, WWF Paraguay. Thank you, Mark. Well, uh, like I like I said before, uh, we cannot just focus on one area or one sector. We have to work, especially with the producers and and the market and the financial institutions. If we don't include them, we are not going to be able to have this recovery of the population or the green, green recovery that we, that we want. Uh, we, have, we are very much engaged to producers in the, in, in the Chaco and Pantanal. And, and Mario is totally right. The, the problem is there that there is a legal deforestation still in those areas. So if we don't in, do, give or develop incentives for the landowners, not to deforest or to reduce the deforestation that is that we are wasting our time. So now we are supporting the round table of responsible uh, uh, beef. Also, we are supporting the, 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 the round table of sustainable finance. And, and that is that have been a very, very strong and powerful initiative. And there are the banks in, in, in the areas where, where they are, uh, buying the, the, the meat from, from Paraguay, for example, like in the Netherlands and the United States and in Germany. And they are requesting to know where their beef that they are buying in Europe and or in the United States is coming from, how we are treating the nature. And unfortunately, it is really too bad that we have had such a great deforestation in the past and now we, we are also working with the government to develop public policies and engaging the, the, the production uh, people, especially in those areas where Jawa are so, uh, so abundant still uh, in the Chaco and Pantanal. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you for bringing up you know, sustainable finance the World Economic, the World Environmental Facility, the uh, GLO, the GEF, the Global Environmental Facility, they're they're financing incredible work uh, in in these regions. 
um, and, and through, through environmental financing, sustainable financing, I'm so glad that you bring up, we need private sector investment. We also need the banks and the countries to invest in these, in these regions and in these, these local communities. So, so thank you. I also appreciate what you're saying about how do we stop the unsustainable deforestation, the illegal timber, the illegal mining. This is the work that is so important because this is, the, this is what puts local and, and indigenous uh, and local communities at risk of exploitation and of, of forced labor of being pushed off their lands. So we have to invest in these regions and invest in these communities. Um, thank you, Lucy. I will ask the same question to Igwa. Igwa, how can you tell us you know, ways that we can further invest in the local communities and, and how we can further invest and make sustainable livelihoods for, for indigenous people, for women and uh, in, in, throughout this region. Thank you. <laughs> you are Mil mute. disculpas, sí, ya, ya va. Es que primero tengo que escuchar la traducción para poder entender a Mark y las preguntas. <laughs> Entonces me demoro unos segundos. Sí, eh, creo que es muy interesante eh, este encuentro porque muchas veces eh, los conocedores, los poseedores del conocimiento tradicional eh, no somos tomados en cuenta. Entonces, quiero partir de allí porque creo que hay, hay varias preguntas, miré en el chat del, de la, del evento, eh, ¿cómo, ¿cómo uno hace? ¿Cuáles son los retos de las mujeres indígenas? O, ¿O cuál es el reto de una organización comunitaria para poder trabajar en tema de conservación de los jaguares? Eh, ¿Cómo uno hace para poder empoderar a, eh, a, a las comunidades en el tema de la conservación? de los jaguares, eh, en, eh, tomando en cuenta la participación comunitaria. Creo que la clave siempre está, y voy a sumar todas estas preguntas en una sola, eh, la clave siempre está en que creo que es una cuestión de ambas vías. Tanto el que tiene el conocimiento o, o, o el que va a dar eh, la promoción de los jaguares, eh, eh, ya sea en tema de fondo, ya sea en tema de participación, tiene que reconocer que las comunidades indígenas tienen un conocimiento y son sujetos de derecho. Eso es partir de allí, hay que reconocer eso. Y nosotros como pueblos indígenas también tenemos que reconocer que hay aliados. Por ejemplo, en este proyecto grande que tenemos ya partiendo desde hace un año, eh, la verdad es que, que tenemos que agradecerle a mucha gente que nos ha abierto y, y ha reconocido la labor de las mujeres. Eh, partiendo del, de pequeñas donaciones, del GEF, de mi ambiente, de las chicas de la organización, de la UMIOP, que sin ellas yo no hubiera podido hacer este proyecto, que día a día están detrás de las cámaras creyendo y empoderándose de este proyecto. Y, que, y creo que si mientras más participación, más, eh, más eh, justa participación le damos a estas comunidades que tienen ese conocimiento, podemos tener como un mundo más equitativo y podemos entendernos. A lo mejor yo no hablo el mismo idioma, ahorita estoy hablando en español y la mayoría habla en inglés, pero nos podemos entender y esos canales de conexión creo que es importante. Otro lado es que nosotros como pueblos indígenas tratamos de mantener nuestros ecosistemas de manera en que haya una relación muy espiritual y quizás el mundo occidental hemos perdido esa parte espiritual esa parte espiritual a esa relación de ecosistema que hay cosas que no podemos perturbar por ejemplo ¿Verdad? Hay ecosistemas que son animales, eh, digámoslo así, para nosotros sagrados, tipo jaguar. Entonces, yo creo que ese conocimiento es muy importante y valoroso para nosotros, pero para el conocimiento científico también. Entonces, creo que si trabajamos de mano y empoderamos más a la gente, tanto de ambas vías, podemos hacer un trabajo excelente junto con todos. Junto con todos. Hay muchos retos para las mujeres. Eh, por ejemplo, ahorita eh, la pregunta que me hicieron en el chat, eh, eh, creo que es un poco difícil a veces para las mujeres, no solamente las mujeres indígenas, todas las mujeres. Tenemos el, el, la tarea de los hogares, de los hijos. Eh, ahora con esta pandemia creo que se nos han doblado los esfuerzos de estar en la casa, de atender esto, de atender todo. Entonces, creo que mientras, mientras podemos entendernos y tratar de trabajar conjunto con todos los socios 
con todos los agremiados, con todas las personas, podemos hacer un trabajo eh, súper interesante y creo que en eso estamos nuestra organización. Eh, también creo que me preguntaron el contacto, nosotras estamos compartiendo los, más adelante los cuentos vía PDF, más cuando ya, ya lo tengamos, eh, nuestra, nuestras redes en el Face, red de eh, mujeres organizadas, eh, Organización de Mujeres Indígenas Unidas por la Biodiversidad, OMIU, esa es nuestra red, en Facebook nos pueden contactar. Gracias. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Igua. Yes, you are absolutely right. We need to remember the sacred connection and the sacred beliefs that the traditional knowledge and the, and the indigenous people have in our in, in in these regions and they are it's so important for our future after going through this covid you know this covid pandemic and and we those sacred beliefs are so important about how we treat the earth so thank you and we agree that we need to invest in local and indigenous communities we have about two more minutes left i just uh quickly uh for fernando um camacho and mario haberfeld Fernando, if we can keep our, our remarks to about a minute about how we can work with local communities and empower them, I'd appreciate it. So Fernando from Mexico, uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Mark. Una vez más en español. En México, en las áreas protegidas, hemos eh, trabajado con el lema de eh, conservar con y para las personas, siempre. Eh, y creo que ese ha sido una de las, de las propuestas más importantes que hemos eh, logrado eh, en México. Siempre considerar a las comunidades, a los dueños y poseedores de la tierra. ¿Y cómo, cómo logramos eh, promover la conservación de jaguar a largo plazo? Eh, me da mucho gusto foros como este que están rompiendo esta idea de los otros, de, de, de trabajar históricamente los conservacionistas platicaban entre los conservacionistas, eh, compartían información y creo que eso es lo que tenemos que romper. Trabajar con, con los otros sectores, con el sector privado, con el sector financiero y que podamos eh, compartir la importancia que tiene la biodiversidad y en especial una especie tan importante como el jaguar. Eh, es importantísimo que las comunidades, nosotros estamos trabajando en México, con, con varios socios, para que las comunidades puedan acceder a mejores mercados, eh, mercados que, que paguen mejor sus productos y de esta manera eh, mejoren su calidad de vida y podamos ir recuperando espacios para las especies. ¿no? Entonces, creo que eso es importantísimo, trabajar con, con el sector financiero que permita tener mejores condiciones de crédito y de esa manera que las comunidades puedan mejorar sus productos y no solamente dejarlo ahí, sino que esos productos puedan llegar a mejores mercados o mercados que sí estén dispuestos a pagar un producto que viene de una comunidad que está conservando y que está trabajando para mantener la biodiversidad. Creo que ahí hay un, una gran oportunidad. Es, es, es parte de lo que estamos implementando en México con nuestros socios. Y... y Esperemos que en un par de años podamos venir aquí y, y platicar sobre los éxitos de estas iniciativas. Gracias, Mark. Y gracias a todos por la invitación. Thank you so much. That, those are very, thank you very much for those comments. They were very inspirational. And now we're going to go to, uh, to Mario. Um, thank you again, Fernando. We'll go to Mario Haberfeld. Um, Mario, can you please continue this concept of empowering communities as well as investing in, um, in these regions and how we can create green economies for, and as well as investment. Thank you, Mar Thank you uh, Mario. No, it's a pleasure, Mark. And uh, first of all, you're welcome to come down in any time. Uh, it will be a pleasure to, to have you down in Brazil. But um, Again, through ecotourism, there's a, a couple of things that we can do to empower communities, especially when we're talking about women. Uh, if you think again of the example of the Pantanal, where it's a predominantly uh, male-based employment with cattle ranching and everything, with ecotourism now, uh, we've changed that. Uh, we've given women opportunities to the point that 60% uh, of our workforce are now women. 
and 90% are in the management uh, teams uh, in the ecotourism business. So this is one thing we can do. And the other thing is make uh, pristine land be more valuable than uh, land that has been destroyed and is under uh, agriculture, for instance. This has happened in Africa. Um, nowadays, if you get a region in the Sabi Sands in South Africa, for example, this is, these are the most expensive um, land outside of cities in South Africa. In Brazil, it's still somewhere where every, the forest has been cut down and there's sugar cane there. But with time, if we can prove the model, I think uh, we can make pristine land more valuable than uh, destroyed land, let's put it that way. Uh, and in that way, uh, we're moving towards the, the right track. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our my the panelists. Um, we have we have definitely talked about not only the sacredness of the places we're trying to preserve, as but we've I, I also appreciate everyone speaking about how we come out of this pandemic. We we invest in these regions through the global environmental facility, uh, through the through the World Bank, through UNDP, USAID, and as well as a private and public partnerships and intergovernmental partnerships. This is. These are all ways to invest in and, and value these regions where, and the people we're trying to save and protect. So I really very much appreciate your help. We are going to take a five minute break. So everyone stay tuned. We've got Christian Sampier from, uh, we've got Christian Samper from, um, from, w, from WCS. He's gonna be leading a, an incredible dialogue with all of our range state, the leaders from our the range countries that are protecting Jaguars. So give us five minutes um, as a break and then we'll come back and we will start a video and we'll see you then. So thank you everybody.
All right, welcome back. Um, we are very excited to be hosting our 2030 Jaguar Dialogue. And now we have our an, an incredible story um, and a video about the Pantanal Jaguar habitat. So please uh, take a look at our video and then we're gonna come back to Christian Samper from WCS um, hosting a panel. Here we go. Okay, still waiting for you to unmute on your side. Okay, here we go. Got it. Are we rolling? All right, here we go. Um, we are we are having a little bit of technical difficulty on sound, but um, I believe we are up and running. Okay, so I am honored to be introducing Christian Samper from the he was the CEO of Wildlife Conservation Society. Wildlife Conservation Society does some of the greatest work worldwide when it comes to conservation. Um, along with the other partners on this project who we've heard from. We heard from w, WF, we've also heard from Panthera, and WCS has been incredibly important in negotiating with the range countries, the Jaguar 2030 protocol, along with UNDP and their partners. So I am honored to be introducing Christian Samper of WCS as he speaks with the, the range partners that are doing the work on the ground. So thank you, Christian, welcome. Thank you very much, Mark, and it's a great pleasure, a great day to be together uh, here as we all gather to celebrate uh, the Jaguar and to plan for its future. And I think the 
The 2030 roadmap certainly gives us a very clear direction of where we can come together, all the 14 countries and all the partners to really work to help save this magnificent creature. And it's gonna take all of us in our efforts to really be able to save it and to restore and rewild some of these populations. So as you mentioned, we, we have a great panel and uh, I hope you enjoyed that video from the Pantanal. I still remember the first time I ever saw a live Jaguar was in the Pantanal in Brazil. And it was an incredible sight. I certainly recommend anyone go there and see it. Uh, it's, it's a great experience and to hear the testimonies. Uh, but uh, the, my second one was in Panama, where I had ch a chance to live uh, some, for a few years ago. So without further ado, we're, we have a great lineup of speakers from the various countries, a number of ministers, uh, to talk a little bit about this and then some of the partners. So we're going to go through this uh, list and thank you all for joining us and for taking time. And we're going to start by um, presenting and sharing a recording that we have from the Minister of Environment of Panama, Mircea de Concepción. El jaguar es el depredador más grande de la América tropical. Requiere extensos territorios para su conservación. Cada día son más escasas las zonas en las que sobrevive y enfrenta amenazas como la reducción y modificación del hábitat, cacería furtiva y el conflicto con los humanos por la depredación al ganado. La complejidad que representa salvar al jaguar en estado silvestre en Panamá es grande y requiere de un esfuerzo sostenido a escala nacional que no puede llevarse a cabo por sectores aislados de la sociedad o el gobierno. Se necesita de acciones concertadas entre la iniciativa privada, la sociedad civil y el gobierno de Panamá. En respuesta a esa necesidad, se elaboró en, do, en el año 2011 el Plan de Acción para la Conservación del Jaguar en Panamá, esfuerzo liderado en ese momento por la Autoridad Nacional del Ambiente y que además contó con la participación de más de 30 expertos de organizaciones no gubernamentales, centros de investigación y universidades especializados en biología y aspectos sociales en temas relacionados con la ecología y conservación del jaguar. Las iniciativas de conservación del jaguar en Panamá se enmarcan o fundamentan precisamente en las necesidades identificadas en dicho plan de acción al impulsar actividades de conservación directa y aplicación de normativas, construcción de capacidades, adquisición, manejo y análisis de información, así como la educación y participación pública. El Ministerio de Ambiente trabaja actualmente en estrecha colaboración con ONGs, sobre todo con la Fundación Yaguará Panamá, para elaborar para abordar integralmente el tema de la conservación del jaguar, haciendo énfasis, por un lado, en la generación de información científica acta para la toma de decisiones y, por el otro, en un seguimiento directo del conflicto jaguar-ganadería a fin de involucrar a los afectados por pérdidas de animales domésticos, generar la confianza necesaria y brindar las orientaciones u opciones de manejo que permitan disminuir o eliminar el riesgo de depredación y, por consiguiente, la matanza de jaguares en represalia. En este sentido, se ha desarrollado monitoreos para evaluar el estado de las poblaciones del jaguar en el país. Asimismo, se ha generado información valiosa para una mejor gestión del conflicto jaguar-ganadería, como los planes de manejo de finca que incluyen medidas contra la depredación. Adicionalmente, se considera importante resaltar que dentro de las acciones para la conservación del jaguar, para el año 2021 se comenzará a ejecutar con la participación de Yaguará Panamá el proyecto GEF, conservación de felinos silvestres y sus presas a través de alianzas público-privadas y la gestión del conflicto humanos jaguar en Panamá 2021-2024, mediante el que se busca consolidar y viabilizar la implementación de acciones concretas para atender más apropiadamente las principales amenazas que enfrenta esta especie en nuestro país, Panamá. La biodiversidad y la preservación de los ecosistemas seguirán constituyendo una prioridad del país en sus políticas públicas con la finalidad de alcanzar los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y una mayor conciencia de los panameños de la importancia del ambiente y una armónica relación de los grupos humanos 
con los recursos naturales. Unidos lo hacemos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias al señor ministro Concepción de Panamá por este mensaje y Panamá como uno de los países centroamericanos que ha estado trabajando en esta visión de eh, para poder establecer estos corredores para la conservación del jaguar. Y ahora es un honor para nosotros contar con la presencia del ministro de Ambiente del Perú, el señor Gabriel Quijandría. Ministro, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros hoy. Adelante. Much, muchas gracias, Cristian. Y en primer lugar, muchas gracias al PNUD por esta invitación para hacer parte de este diálogo del jaguar, nuestro gran felino de las, de las Américas, nuestro gran gato, este, que es parte de esta discusión, además, más global sobre los grandes gatos. Eh, el jaguar eh, ha sido caracterizado en un, una cantidad muy grande de expresiones culturales en toda América y ocupa un rol protagónico en las culturas precolombinas del Perú y del resto de los países de la región. Eh, se supone que su rugido es un presagio de fertilidad y bienestar para los ecosistemas. El nombre que usamos aquí en el Perú de Otorongo deriva del quechua Uturuncu, que significa significa el que mata de un salto. La información científica para conservar el jaguar nos muestra que se requiere de una visión de conservación a escala de paisaje que ocupa solamente el, no solamente el nivel nacional, sino también el transfronterizo. Y en ese sentido, la hoja de ruta 2030 para la conservación del jaguar en las Américas, que suscribimos el año 2018 y cuyo plan de acción se ratificó este año, representa una propuesta innovadora y fundamental para lograr la conservación de esta especie y contribuir a los ODS que están vinculados a su persistencia en el tiempo. Hoy nos reunimos para discutir alternativas de integración para fortalecer la conservación del jaguar a nivel regional y es un momento oportuno, por tanto, para reflexionar sobre el valor que representa esta especie y cómo podemos integrar los esfuerzos que se están llevando a cabo con otras metas ambientales, como las del cambio climático, por ejemplo. Asimismo, es una oportunidad para poder encontrar soluciones prácticas y efectivas ante las amenazas emergentes a la supervivencia de este felino, como el incremento del uso de partes de jaguar con fines artesanales y el tráfico de colmillos. No olvidemos que el jaguar está reemplazando al tigre en muchos de los mercados internacionales de comercialización de partes de grandes gatos. Y, por tanto, los precios en el mercado negro asiático llegan a casi 4 mil dólares por unidad. Los esfuerzos de los gobiernos, la sociedad civil y la cooperación internacional deben unirse, no solo para mantener áreas naturales protegidas viables, sino para conservar el paisaje entero a través de corredores que aseguren el movimiento de los jaguares, es decir, manejar todo el paisaje de manera sistémica. Es por ello que desde el Ministerio del Ambiente no solo estamos comprometidos con implementar la hoja de ruta 2030, sino que también estamos incorporando el enfoque de conservación del paisaje en todos nuestros proyectos, fortaleciendo los medios de vida sostenibles para comunidades locales y promoviendo oportunidades de negocio para el ecoturismo y otras actividades productivas que puedan convivir en armonía con la conservación de especies como el jaguar. Asimismo, en función de nuestro rol como implementadores de convenciones como CITES o la CMS, debemos implementar planes de conservación que integren ineduliblemente estrategias transfronterizas establecidas en la hoja de ruta. Finalmente, debemos seguir reforzando el vínculo de la especie con la ciudadanía. Es por ello que los principales esfuerzos que ha desplegado el Perú para promover la conservación del jaguar y mitigar los impactos de los conflictos con el hombre están acompañados de estrategias de difusión, concientización y educación a gran escala, como por ejemplo la incorporación de la especie en nuestra numismática nacional en una serie que terminó este año este, de manera muy exitosa. Muchísimas gracias nuevamente por la invitación. Muchas gracias al ministro que andría por sus intervenciones, por sus comentarios, y en particular también por resaltar no solamente el trabajo que hay que hacer en los países, sino esa conexión con el tráfico ilegal y el tráfico internacional que nos recuerda que la solución va más allá de las fronteras de los países rango del jaguar y que tenemos que realmente mirarlo y es uno de los compromisos que todos tenemos que trabajar. A continuación vamos a escuchar las palabras del señor Franklin Paniagua, que es el viceministro del Medio Ambiente de Costa Rica. 
El jaguar es conocido como el ícono del desarrollo sostenible en América y su hábitat está amenazado. Por esto se creó el Foro Internacional 2030, que dio lugar al lanzamiento de la declaración en Nueva York del Jaguar 2030, en la que se integran iniciativas para la conservación del jaguar, precedidas por Costa Rica. Agradezco al Comité de Coordinación de Jaguar 2030, integrado por Pantera, WCS, WWF y el PNUD, y precedido por el director ejecutivo del GEF, nuestro amigo Carlos Manuel Rodríguez. La invitación a participar en este diálogo Jaguar 2030, una hoja de ruta para la conservación y el crecimiento verde inclusivo. Costa Rica ha participado en todas las iniciativas vinculadas a la conservación de jaguares en, eh, en nuestro continente, en particular en, eh, a nivel de CITES en la COP18 con la decisión sobre tráfico ilegal de productos y subproductos de jaguares, en la CMS, en la COP13, la inclusión de jaguares en los apéndices 1 y 2 de la CMS y en el CBD, la ruta de jaguares del 2030. La Ruta de Jaguar 2030 ha sido respaldada por 15 de los 18 gobiernos del área eh, de nuestra América Latina. Costa Rica busca a nivel de toda América crear conciencia sobre la necesidad de conservar los corredores del jaguar y sus hábitats como parte de los esfuerzos más amplios para la consecución de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible de las Naciones Unidas. Actualmente Costa Rica está liderando estas iniciativas citadas anteriormente para promover la conservación del hábitat del jaguar y el crecimiento verde inclusivo mismo después de la crisis del COVID-19. En la conservación del jaguar, la salud y la recuperación ecológica son tres elementos fundamentales de la atención en la gestión de recursos naturales en nuestros países. Es así, la importancia del jaguar y su hábitat en el desarrollo sostenible es eh, un imponderable que debemos siempre tener presente. Es trascendente destacar la importancia de la conectividad en el paisaje a, la verde, a través de toda América Latina. En el caso de Costa Rica somos en sí un puente entre las dos masas continentales y entendemos nuestro papel en ese flujo genético en particular para nuestra especie emblemática, el jaguar. Trabajemos juntos para mantener saludables los paisajes del jaguar, para salud y prosperidad de las personas y del planeta. Hagamos un cambio, protejamos a nuestros jaguares de América. Bueno, muchas gracias al viceministro por este mensaje de Costa Rica, que ha sido uno de los países que más ha trabajado el tema y, y es uno de los países que ha tenido una estrategia mental durante mucho tiempo y ha podido incrementar el área de bosques y este tema de la conectividad, que es algo eh, muy importante. Y para seguir conectando estos países y esta ruta del jaguar y lo que podemos hacer, eh, es un placer para nosotros tener al señor Sergio Graf, que es el ministro de Ambiente de Jalisco, en México. Adelante, por favor. Muchas gracias. Agradezco mucho la invitación para que Jalisco se sume a esta gran iniciativa internacional. El ámbito hogareño del jaguar es muy amplio. En el territorios con gran presión social y económica como el Pacífico Mexicano, se requieren mecanismos de colaboración y coordinación entre los estados, pero también a nivel intergubernamental con el gobierno federal, estatal y municipal y con todos los actores del sector privado y productores involucrados. Jalisco es un estado clave de conectividad en el Pacífico Mexicano. Es una zona de confluencia entre la Sierra Madre del Sur, la Sierra Madre Occidental, que conecta hacia el centro del país, hacia el sur, y la Sierra Madre Occidental hacia la conectividad en el, el, el norte. Esto eh, nos obliga como estado a comprometernos eh, en la conservación de los ecosistemas que son hábitat de especies como el jaguar a través de la implementación de políticas transversales con el sector agropecuario para mantener zonas de conectividad entre zonas de uso y las áreas naturales protegidas para asegurar el movimiento de desplazamiento y la conservación del hábitat de esta importante especie. Eh, esto también eh, nos obliga a aprovechar la sinergia e iniciativas que han lanzado organizaciones civiles como el FONOR en el programa 
eh, MIJO, que es el, el Programa de Manejo Integrado del Hábitat del Jaguar, del Fondo del Noroeste, y próximamente la firma del convenio eh, con WWF para el proyecto de conectividad para la protección eh, del jaguar en eh, el estado de Jalisco, así como un proyecto de conectividad general de Jalisco con la Agencia Francesa eh, de Desarrollo. La conservación de la biodiversidad es fundamental con otras agendas como la de cambio climático para la, eh, asegurar una adecuada adaptación y mitigación a este enorme fenómeno y asegurar eh, un bienestar general de la población. El Fórum de Alto Nivel de Jaguar 2030 es una gran oportunidad del diálogo que saber es, de saberes que permiten implementar acciones de manera coordinada para lograr la conservación de una especie reconocida por nuestros ancestros y por nuestras comunidades como clave para nuestra vida. Salvemos al jaguar. Muchas gracias, eh, señor ministro, y qué bueno ver que Jalisco está comprometido con esto y trabajando. Now let me switch back to English and we can continue our uh, tour through the various range countries. And of course, in the part of South America, the, the Guyanas and the, uh, the northern part of the Amazon is an incredible, incredibly important area. And we have uh, a message from Diana Poki, who is the Minister of Land Policy and Forest Management from the Republic of Suriname. Ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues, all protocols observe. Good morning. With reference uh, to the purpose of the meeting, I address to you the following statement. Suriname has similarities but different uh, circumstances compared to the other countries within the wider range of the Jaguar in the Americas. Already stated as a Jaguar important country, with 14% of land cover established as protected areas, including the Central Suriname Nature Reserve of 1.6 million hectares, with remote areas of pristine tropical rainforest and vast areas of uninhabited natural coastal ecosystems. It can play an important role in the conservation of the jaguar and become a refuge and corridor where the jaguar can be protected and studied within the natural dynamics of undisturbed habitat. In 2002, Suriname was already concerned about the species and change national status from a game species with an all year close season to a fully protected species. Since the last uh, statement in 2018 in New York, Suriname has received assistance from EFO, Pantera, WWF, IUCN, Netherlands, CI and Interpol. With the help of Pantera, a national monitoring of Jaguar is beginning to take root. This year, 2020, preparations for training of law enforcement and prosecutors in the matter of Jaguar protection have been made with international organizations, but through the COVID situation, this have not been implemented yet. The training will be executed with adapted measures. Awareness programs have been implemented and we already see a difference in the way the communities and entrepreneurs see the general. The threat of illegal trade still ex exists, but no strong indications of organized international illegal trade of the general or its parts. The pursuer towards this form of wildlife crime as recognized be by Interpol is closely monitored by the enforcement authority and can shift at any time. Suriname is concerned about this species and together in collaboration with other range states and NGOs we will tackle the protection of Jaguar. Thank you. So thank you very much to the Minister of Land Policy and Forest Management of Suriname, uh, 
and to keep in this uh, geography, uh, we are honored to be joined by Cyril Barnerias, who's the International Director for the French Biodiversity Office. Cyril, thank you very much for joining us and please go ahead. Thank you very much, Christian, and uh, buenos, buenos dias and uh, hello to everyone. Um, so yes, we are French Guiana is a close neighbor to Suriname and Brazil. Uh, very rapidly, as the um, status of Jaguar in French Guiana is relatively good. Uh, we estimated the density of 3.2 individuals per 100 uh, square kilometers in protected areas in uh, 2070s. 2017. Our agency recently acquired data on living territory size, behavior, uh, following captures, and daily activities, allowing us to uh, improve our knowledge of the jaguar on the French Guiana territory. Uh, the jaguar is uh, partially protected uh, in French Guiana with a zero quota um, hunting and which do not apply to uh, local communities in indigenous uh, zones. Um, as often in the range of jaguar, uh, the main threats that we face uh, for jaguar are habitat destruction and fragmentation uh, related to agriculture uh, extension and urban development, especially on the coast uh, of uh, French Guiana. Poaching, uh, human jaguar conflicts uh, are increasing due to attacks on livestock, uh, so we also try to 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 relocate some jaguars with uh, not so uh, good results. Uh, and we published a guide to prevent uh, conflicts with uh, between human and, uh, and, and jaguars. Um, I can say also that there are close links between uh, the French approach with regards to biodiversity conservation and the jaguar roadmap. So uh, ministries in France are discussing uh, about uh, the Jaguar roadmap um, very, uh, very intensely. And uh, finally, I will conclude to say that we would be more than happy, of course, to cooperate with, uh, with other countries uh, to better protect Jaguar in its range and especially in the Guiana's range. Thank you very much. I thank you very much, uh, Cyril. And as we heard before, certainly the, the Guyanas are a, a very different situation from other parts of uh, South America and that most of the habitat is still relatively intact. It's great to see those figures of the Jaguar density and the work that you're doing and the cooperation across the, the Guyanas, which is a very important uh, part of the anchor. And we're delighted to have you here. And thank you to France for what you're doing here and in the international setting, including uh, the very active role that France is playing in the international scene with, by hosting the IUCN Congress. We all hope to be able to join at some point and uh, next year when we get past this COVID and also the CBD and linking these connections. So thank you uh, for your leadership here. All right, um, let's uh, continue on the, <clears throat> the next uh, statement that we have. Uh, it comes from another of the range countries and that's from Ecuador. And uh, we have a message from Leonardo Chang, who's the Vice Minister of the Environment. Dear all, on behalf of the Minister of Environment and Water of Ecuador, Mr. Paulo Proaño, I want to give you an enormous thank to Jeff, the World Bank, USAID, UNPD, WCS, and the participating countries of the Global Wildlife Program. We hope all of you are a good on these hard times. As you know, the jaguar is the largest feline on the American continent and a magnificent animal that plays an important role in the functions of the ecosystems, regulating the populations of fauna, which is why the jaguars are considered an umbrella species. In Ecuador, the jaguar has a distribution on both sides of the Andes, the Amazon and the coast. However, the coastal population are rapidly disappearing throughout their geographical range. We have worked on a national action plan for its conservation, making us pioneers in owning and implementing an action plan for a big feline. The main objectives included in this document are to maintain and restore viable jaguar's population in coexistence with a, with the human's population working on a landscape, a scope, and last but not least, environmental education and communication with the population that co with it. 
The action plan was proposed in 2014 for a period of 10 years. In 2021, it is expected to be updated and further developed with the help of our project integrating landscape consideration in the conservation of wildlife, with emphasis in jowers, which is a child project from Jeff Global Wildlife Program. Our project focus is to conserve wildlife and their associated habitats in critical landscapes in Ecuador and to incorporate lessons to learn international strategies and widely shared lessons learned among the Jaguars range countries in the region. This is possible through three main components, conserve wildlife and its habitat, combat crimes against wildlife and promote green economy, and based on the sustainable use of wildlife. Ecuador is a country committed to the conservation of biodiversity. For this reason, it is important for us to address the challenge of conserving the habitat of great fauna. Thank you. Sembramos futuro. Muchas gracias al señor viceministro de Ambiente del Ecuador por este mensaje y por recordarnos, obviamente, que esta es una especie que se encuentra no solo en la cuenca amazónica, sino en la cuenca eh, del Pacífico y el trabajo que está haciendo este país. Y el jaguar es una especie que tiene, como todos sabemos, un rango de distribución muy amplio desde México, de hecho, desde Estados Unidos hasta Argentina. Y en ese sentido me complace mucho que tenemos eh, hoy con nosotros a Florencia Gómez, la secretaria de Políticas Ambientales y Recursos Naturales de la Argentina. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros y adelante. Good morning, good afternoon to the all countries and the participants of Chagua 230 Dialogue. I send you a cordial greeting from the Minister of the Environmental and Sustainable Development, Juan Cavandier. We share the concern for the conservation of the shower and we are committed from the place and responsibility that fall to us as a competent national body to advance in coordinated action and measures of the, ration, of the regional level to improve the situation of these species. I would like to share you with some information about the situation of the shower in Argentina. Eh, I'll do it in Spanish. Eh, en cuanto a Argentina, eh, nosotros hemos promovido eh, la declaración de especie, de especie emblemática eh, en el ámbito de CITES. Desde el 2017, el jaguar ha sido declarado en peligro crítico de extinción en el marco del plan de conservación del monumento Jaguarete. Eh, llevamos adelante acciones de articulación con otros sectores, especialmente con eh, las actividades de fiscalización eh, en cuanto al trabajo con fuerzas de seguridad, llevando eso hacemos capacitaciones para fortalecer y promover el conocimiento y, y evitar y luchar contra el tráfico ilegal de especies, de hecho a una conocida empresa internacional eh, hemos, hemos comunicado digamos, la necesidad de que dejen de, de, de ofrecer eh, productos derivados del, del jaguar. Eh, se lleva adelante un trabajo con el programa de pequeñas donaciones y el, y, el, y el PNUD Argentina para llevar adelante una app de monitoreo y proyectos en el marco de PPD que trabajan especialmente en la articulación con los sectores ganaderos. Y por otra parte estamos iniciando un, un proyecto con financiamiento JEF intersectorial para trabajar en corredores biológicos y evitar los accidentes, los accidentes viales que también son causa, digamos, de la extinción del jaguarete. Por otra parte, ha sido declarada especie migratoria, con, con lo cual esperamos avanzar en la articulación con países limítrofes y llevamos adelante un protocolo de, por parte de la autoridad de parques de la administración de parques nacionales, un protocolo sobre consulta previa libre e informada para las distintas actividades de conservación. En ese marco es un compromiso del Ministerio de Ambiente luchar contra la pérdida de bosques nativos, entendiendo que una de las principales amenazas del, del yaguareté es la pérdida y fragmentación de su hábitat, lo que lo obliga eh, a partir de los incendios, a partir de la deforestación, a buscar y a quedar reducido en pequeños, en pequeños sectores. En ese sentido, todas las actividades eh, eh, emanan mucho esfuerzo y lo llevamos adelante junto con 
las agencias de cooperación internacional, más los gobiernos provinciales que también están comprometidos. Muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, Florencia, por estar con nosotros y por compartir eh, ese compromiso de, de Argentina eh, como parte de uno de los países rango de esta distribución. Es eh, muy importante contar con esto. Y usted mencionó, obviamente, que, una, eh, que el jaguar ha sido incluido como una de las especies en el marco de la Convención Migratoria de Especies. Uh, y en ese sentido, and I'll switch to English now, although she, she speaks more Spanish than, uh, unless you want to do it in Spanish, Amy. But we're yes. delighted to have uh, closing uh, for this panel, uh, Amy Frankel, who is a good friend uh, of us and of mine, but we're delighted to have you here as the secretary of the Convention of Migratory Species. I think it's a very important issue to remind that these international instruments like CITES or the Convention of Migratory Species are key as we look at the conservation uh, of species like the jaguar. So Amy, thanks for joining us and please share with us and tell us a little bit of why the jaguar is included in CMS and what CMS can help to this pro program of the 2030 route. Okay, thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Christian, y gracias a todos, but I will continue in English. Uh, it is a real pleasure to join you all today And my sincere thanks to colleagues from USAID and UNDP uh, for organizing this very important and timely event. Uh, so honorable ministers, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, earlier this year at the 13th conference of the parties of CMS, the governments of Costa Rica, Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay proposed to list the Jaguar on both appendix one and appendix two of the convention proposal was adopted, which provides unprecedented international protections for the Jaguar. Under Appendix 1, range states must prohibit the taking of Jaguars and undertake efforts to maintain and restore habitat and remove barriers to the free movement of animals across their range. Under Appendix 2, range state parties are to cooperate on conservation measures, including development of conservation agreements for the species. Now, I am keenly aware that there have been significant uh, efforts on the Jaguar uh, within the range states and across the region, uh, supported by the work of many dedicated partners. We want to work carefully with all of you to determine the best way that CMS can add value to our shared goals. Now, the mandate of CMS is the conservation and sustainable use of migratory species and their habitats. We focus both on conservation measures, such as the use of area-based management, as well as on addressing threats, including over-exploitation of species and habitat destruction related to various human activities. CMS has significant experience in supporting range states and partners in developing and implementing multi-country instruments, ranging from legally binding agreements to more informal initiatives that allow both parties and non-parties to CMS to participate. The Memorandum of Understanding on the Conservation of Sharks is a good example. It's a non-binding uh, agreement, but we have both parties as well as non-parties to CMS very actively participating, uh, including the United States. The point is that CMS provides flexibility for multi-state cooperation to be tailored to different situations. The nature of uh, the natural migration of the jaguar reflects one of the core needs of all migratory species, which is ecological connectivity. This principle is well reflected in the roadmap 2030. As you know, to ensure the survival of the jaguar, its genetic diversity needs to be secured. This requires that the migratory pathways of the jaguar and its habitat are connected throughout its range. This clearly calls on regional cooperation. This work will also require increased resources for scientific research, planning, policy, and on the ground implementation. There are numerous initiatives under CMS addressing ecological connectivity. For example, in 2014, CMS uh, adopted the COP adopted guidelines to address the impact of linear infrastructure on large migratory mammals in Central Asia, These have been used, for example, by 
Mongolian Railroad Company to build wildlife friendly fences. The joint CITES-CMS African Carnivores Initiative includes the establishment of wildlife corridors. The CMS Energy Task Force is providing technical guidelines and best practices to ensure wildlife friendly energy infrastructure. And finally, we are also working with our parties and others to ensure that the post 2020 global biodiversity framework strongly includes this concept of connectivity. In closing, we know a great deal of work uh, has to be done in order to address the plight of the jaguar. We are honored and, and thrilled to be part of that work. We look forward to working with all of you to make jaguar con conservation a success. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, and thank you for uh, your leadership in CMS. It's been really great to see you there uh, with your experiences you bring and uh, including the reflections you just made about the importance of connectivity and the gene flow across the whole range, which is something critical. And we've had the pleasure of seeing the progress we've made in many species, including sharks and others. And I think really re recognizing how these species need to be analyzed across the whole range uh, and taking conservation measures across them is something uh, really important. So we look forward to working with CMS. I know all the countries are uh, on Jaguar and on some of the other species, including other big cats, but thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, so I'd, I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, who've joined us. Some of them had to come in and go out to the various ministers, but I think that was a very useful range. And you can see clearly the commitment uh, of the various countries, uh, the ministers and the highest level, all the way from Mexico to Argentina. And I think what it reminds us is that if we really want to look after the Jaguar, we have to look across the entire range and the distribution across those 14 countries. And as was mentioned in the at the beginning of the program today, one of the great stories here is that we still have more than 50% of the range of the original range of the Jaguar across us, which really allows us to do the conservation. Now, I'll come back to this a little bit later comparing jaguar with some of the other species of big cats that we're working on. But there's certainly a number of common elements that we heard in the various presentations and the statements of the various countries. Uh, clearly the whole issue of conservation of the habitat uh, of where the jaguars live is key. We've seen many countries have really advanced a lot in this by increasing area-based management measures. And that's something incredibly important. But the point that Amy just made about connectivity. Part of the challenge that we have is we're seeing as there are more and more human pressure, we're seeing the fragmentation of many of these areas and we end up with isolated patches in some cases. And we really wanna protect this. We need to restore and maintain that connectivity across the whole range so we have that gene flow happening across the various places. And as a matter of fact, just a couple of days ago, we at the Wildlife Conservation Society with many other partners just published an important study about the state of what we call the forest integrity worldwide. And what we found is that across the world, only 40% of the forest are still relatively intact. That is not impacted by things like roads and infrastructure and others. And those critical areas, the intact areas, are exactly the kind of areas that are very important for the future of species like the jaguar. So I think having these kinds of tools to look at the status of the forest and the populations across the range of uh, the jaguar is a critical issue. So seriously connecting and conserving these areas is important. Uh, several of our participants also reminded us about the pressures on Jaguar, including some of the pressures that come from beyond the range. So areas like uh, issues like wildlife trafficking and the pressure that we're seeing in some of these countries like Bolivia or Peru or others about poaching for Jaguars and some of these parts going to international markets for wildlife trade is something that we have seen at WCS and some of the countries we work. It's something that has us very concerned. And that's where working with international instruments like CITES and others and many governments worldwide is critical because some of these threats clearly come from beyond the region itself and we need to look at this. Um, a third issue we heard of course was the, the importance of the looking at sustainable development tourism and other measures because these, many of these jaguars including Pantanal and other areas are jaguars are coexisting with many of these populations in areas that are used for other production systems including cattle grazing and ranching and others and I've seen it in Colombia which is a country where I'm from originally in the Llanos Orientales which is a very important area for jaguars and what we've seen is that human wildlife conflict is something that can really take uh, have negative consequences for both jaguars for people and for uh, cattle and other animals here. So it's something we really have to look at. 
And that's why, as we heard in the first panel this morning, solutions around ecotourism and solutions that create jobs and really allow alternatives and create employment for local people is something really important. So we have to look at this. It's part of the work that we at WCS are doing in countries like Paraguay as well. Um, now, let me take a moment to reflect. So this is a, an important dialogue and part of a larger series uh, looking at big cats and, and the opportunities uh, for conservation and development across them. We at the Wildlife Conservation Society are, are very fortunate to work worldwide in other species like tigers or lions or many others that we will be addressing in some of the other sessions It's as part of this dialogue. And I'm sure Mark may talk about this a little bit more. But I do want to highlight an important difference. Uh, say in, in tigers, we, we have worked in tigers across Asia for a long, long time. And what we see is almost 98% of the original range of tigers is gone. There's only about 3,500 tigers left. So the issue there is not only protecting, but restoring and rebuilding many of these populations. That's a challenge that we're seeing there. It's sort of gone through this bottleneck. And we have opportunities there. In Africa, we see species like lions that we also work on. And we see that they're the populations of uh, lions have been decimated and are really declining very, very fast. And it's something we, where we have to secure some of these and conserve them and rebuild them. But the situation we have in the Americas with jaguars is quite different in that, as, we, as we, has been discussed, as I mentioned early on, we still have the bulk of the range. And that's an incredible opportunity we have to really be able to protect those areas, to connect them, to restore them, and to find solutions working through partnerships. And I think that's the lesson that we have learned uh, in the work we do everywhere. What this is going to require is a longer term vision, which is what the 2030 roadmap gives us, a real plan and a, a framework that we can all sign up for. And it's wonderful to see 14 countries coming together, summing to this and, and being part of the overall solution. But it's going to be partnerships with others. And I was very happy to hear in the first panel of the intervention, the voice of indigenous peoples because that traditional knowledge is a critical element as we look to this, and also private sector, uh, whether it's tourism or other players in this or, or uh, different kinds of landowners. It's going to require all of us coming together, and we as one of the uh, civil society organizations that work across most of the countries in, in the Jaguar range certainly see this and are committed to working with the governments and with our local partners to build this and to be able to really conserve and restore the Jaguar, not only for the Jaguar, because as was mentioned early on, the Jaguar is a flagship species. It is about conserving these forests. It's about conserving these ecosystems. And it's about looking at building a model for sustainable development across these regions. And then let me conclude, and I'm gonna pass it back to Mark in a second, but with a reflection about the bigger picture of what we're doing right now and what we're seeing. Uh, this of course has been an extraordinary year for all of us with this pandemic. And it's, uh, it's something that reminds us that we live in an interconnected world. And as we all know, this pandemic actually has a zoonotic origin. So it's directly tied to the wildlife trade. And that's something that we have been working on. And we've, that's one of the reasons we've been promoting what we call the One Health approach. It's looking at the interface between human health, wildlife health and ecosystem health. I think these are critical elements where we have to come together. And if we really want to confront this pandemic, but prevent the future pandemics as well, one of the critical things we need to do is deal with wildlife trade, but also protect the integrity of some of these ecosystems that are out there. Because we know by managing that human wildlife interface, it's one of the most important things we do to be able to prevent these things going forward. And then, of course, the other big one that was mentioned by several is climate change. And climate is another huge issue that has global impacts. And I think the example we saw in Pantanal is a very good example of how climate is impacting the ecosystem and the functionings of the grasslands, of the forest, the fires that we're seeing throughout many parts of Central America and parts of the Amazon right now are a powerful reminder that the intensity and the frequency of these is being exacerbated by climate change. And that the flip side is we also know that one of the most important solutions for climate comes directly from the conservation of some of these forests. So there isn't this interrelationship between conserving biodiversity and species like jaguars, dealing with climate change, including nature-based solutions, and looking at well-being, including the issue of pandemics, is part of what we need to do as part of our strategy looking forward. And I think the 2030 roadmap and the strategy gives us a very good framework to do this. And we at WCS certainly look forward to working with our partners, with UNDP, 
the Vidivea, Pantera, and all the others to really be able to see this move it forward and to save Jaguars, save ourselves, and to really have a great example of building sustainable development across Latin America. So thank you very much for the opportunity to join you for these reflections, Mark. I'm going to give it back to you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here as part of this panel, and we look forward to the other events in the series. Wow. Thank you, Christian Samper. This is um, an inc that was incredible uh, hearing from the range countries about all the incredible work you all are doing, uh, you know, with WCS is doing with all the range countries, as well as the other partners on the 2030 roadmap. Um, it's so inspiring. And I appreciate you also, Christian, bringing up the fact that, you know, we have these, we're, we will be speaking in our further dialogues about other big cats, you know, for instance, the work that we at Grace Farms Foundation have done with WCS in Uganda, empowering the task forces to collaborate and to work together to work with WCS and to combat wildlife trafficking. But most, but as you were mentioning, it's not just about, it's, it, we have to work to combat wildlife trafficking and we have to facilitate and coordinate with task forces, but we also need to work to save these incredible large landscapes that exist. And, and that is absolutely right. I mean, look, we are, the reason we are in this pandemic is because we were encroaching into the most remote places on the planet and we were and harvesting illegally the wildlife and bringing it back. And, you know, this is exactly where the zoonotic diseases come from. So, so I'm excited because you're right. We have a big opportunity to change the way we have been operating. To, to actually preserve these large landscapes and use nature-based solutions to restore the, the, the ecosystems and the habitat as well as help our climate. These are very exciting times. And, and you know, the work that's being done, um, the work that's being done on the 2030 roadmap and the fact that we have a window to actually save the Jaguar and to save ourselves um, and to save our communities and indigenous cultures, to work with indigenous cultures to empower green economies. That's what this, work is all about from UNDP, from USAID, from the from GEF and, and the World Bank, as well as our incredible partners like w, WCS, uh, WWF and, and, um, and Panthera on this project. So I wanna welcome, I wanna thank everybody for tuning into these Big Cat Dialogues. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but it's an exciting time. We can do this. We, we can bring back our, our economies, we can, we can save the big cats, and we can save large landscapes as well as helping indigenous people from exploitation. So we appreciate everybody coming on board and staying with us for the last two and a half hours. We will see you in 2021 for further big cat dialogues that will cover the, the, the snow leopards, they'll cover the incredible work of, the, of tiger pre preservation and protection, as well as the other big cats like lions, et cetera. So we appreciate your help and your standing with us and, uh, and appreciate all of our partners that are doing the great work in the field. So thank you from UNDP, USAID, and me at Grace Farms Foundation. We appreciate it and we will see you soon in the, in the 2021. Keep up the great work, everybody. We can all be part of the solution. We can all take action to create positive change for big cats and for ourselves.